Okay, so as I said, uh, um, looks like we're heading towards a new paradigm, and I, I uh, really, everything I've got to say could make a whole uh, series of lectures, so I can only give a very general description of most of it. Um, well, the first point is that there are some problems with the current paradigm in physics. It's getting a bit stuck, you might say, and uh, people are always saying, well, it's nice doing theory, it doesn't matter if it doesn't fit the experiments. Okay, so uh, I'll, this uh, slide just lists various problems. Um, one is uh, the three uh, forces, strong, weak, and electromagnetic, are nicely unified by something called the, um, uh, the, the um, what's it called, uh, the unified theory of them all. And you, it's a problem fitting, or standard model it's called, um, but it's a problem fitting gravity into that. Uh, people have tried uh, making a bigger group of supersymmetry that that predicts um, so-called superparticles. Every particle has a corresponding superparticle. They hope the Large Hadron Collider would show these, but it, it doesn't, so that's a bit <coughs> annoying. Um, but things have turned up which weren't expected, dark matter and dark energy. There are various ideas about dark matter, dark energy. Well, you're going to have to change your, your theory. It's not really explained. Um, the simplest theory turns out not to fit experiments, and going beyond uh, that, um, so there are too many possibilities, and it's not clear which. In fact, there's 10 to some large number in some model. Uh, yeah, no, another problem that um, it's hard to interpret quantum mechanics. You can do calculation, so there's the um, idea, uh, well, forget about uh, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, just shut up and calculate. And somebody responded saying, um, uh, shut up and uh, cogitate, or whatever it is, contemplate. Um, okay, so uh, how are we to uh, go beyond? Well, um, the answer seems to be that biologists know things that physicists don't. And uh, the paper I mentioned um, in the 1980s, uh, collaborating with Michael Conrad and Dietrich Home. Uh, we uh, were interested, first of all, the mystical ideas of Fritjof Kapra, but what we came to was more concrete, is there are parallels between uh, biology and quantum mechanics. Uh, this is in this slide. Um, okay, so uh, our proposal was that there, since there are these nice parallels, the cause is probably that there's a, a deeper picture, and in some cases you get quantum behavior, in other cases, you get biological behavior, depending on the circumstances. Uh, a diagnosis of the problem uh, or, is that um, physics insists on a quantitative uh, approach. Well, it, it prefers a quantitative approach to nature. You get equations. That's nice because you can um, use the equation to test if your theory is right. Does it predict the right numbers? Biology doesn't use equations very much. What it does is um, it's a descriptive picture. Uh, this involves um, uh, finding certain patterns. You, you name them, things like immune system, and you study that. That works quite well in biology. So if nature is fundamentally biological, this would explain why you get into problems with the uh, quantum approach, because that's quantitative. People try to produce equations. <coughs> Okay, so perhaps then we should start from biology and see if that can be adapted to physics. And I'll just sketch how this goes. First of all, one of the things I came across most recently is something called coordination dynamics. I'll explain in detail what it is, but that um, is an approach to biology involving units called synergies. And that is nice and scientific because for start you can do measurements to um, see this process happening. You can also make mathematical models with equations, and the equations uh, fit the theory, and so on. So that's a, a very nice um, scheme to start off with. Another thing which uh, probably very few people know, unless they're in artificial intelligence, there's a nice 
computer simulation of language. It's amazingly complicated as language is, but it actually works. It will interpret quantum mechanics. And this uh, seems similar to the um, coordination dynamics, suggesting that coordination dynamics is the right picture of nature. Uh, okay, uh, another piece of picture is something I call nature as designer. The point is that uh, natural language is something which uh, seems is, is a, uh, a process that works much better than anything that w human beings have been able to approach. So nature seems to have designed the language we speak. Why does this happen? Uh, so the, uh, once you get this picture, you get the idea that mind may have an important role, so ideas may actually do things. And this um, may be very controversial because um, it fits with um, the, the idea that, um, uh, well, it, the, well, intelligent design, say that sort of thing, it would, might justify that. Uh, also, a thing which is really for the future, connecting with quantum mechanics. One can see in some ways how this biological picture will account for things happening in quantum mechanics. Someone called Karen Barrett has written a book about this. Okay, so that's the outline of what I'm going to talk about. So, first thing is coordination. Um, well, first of all, uh, there's a uh, very nice um, well, person who's been doing most of the development. This is someone called Scott Kelslow. He's written a very nice book chapter, which he's made available on the research page. So you can, that shows into quite a bit of detail what the theory is, and it's worth looking at if you're interested in this at all. Um, you can get to it by going to research gates and searching for the name Kelslow and uh, coordination dynamics. Okay, now uh, there are these things called synergies, um, which are similar to functions in computer programs. And the point about this is that you can make design a very complicated system by design it bit by bit. You define one function which does one thing, another function which uses those functions, and then another function and so on. You can build up complexity that way. So this uh, structure of um, bits working together <coughs> is something which lets you build up complex machinery. Okay, um, and uh, how do these uh, functions develop? Well, it's pieces, they're pieces that work together, and uh, the, uh, the research you look for these pieces are actually the degrees of freedom of the uh, system concerned. And the idea is that these will develop by feedback. Um, in fact, we, we learn to coordinate by, say, learning to walk, you have to coordinate two different things, stepping forwards and balance. Um, we learn that by feedback, trial and error, and we make, uh, eventually we get a thing which works very nicely. So this is the process by which functions develop, if they can do. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, I said it's not just a, a theory, but it's uh, scientific in the sense that you can make models and fit them to experiment. May I? Yeah. No. Uh, is the object to describe atoms and molecules and gravity systems or uh, uh, the anatomy of the brain? Or uh, the no, these are really higher level things. Um, and uh, uh, so they are processes, and um, at some point you would feed in atoms and molecules, at least this would be a very low level if you were doing it. Brains are made of cells. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, one nice thing there's a diagram in his uh, in his uh, explanation, which talks about this being a different approach. And he, uh, it's essentially that this is a different framework. You look for different things, and I put arrows by the most important ones. Um, this is self-organization, which happens in biology, but not so much in physics. Um, and uh, one important thing is uh, structure. Um, this is sort of like the last question in, in, uh, in the audience. Um, in physics, it's um, 
uh, forces which determine the interaction. Is that what? Uh, is that? Yes. Um, whereas in these synergies, it's information exchange which which works things. So that's a key difference. Um, one thing is that the things that <coughs> are interacting are, so we say, movements rather than things. In a crystal, that's a static structure. Well, at least the structure doesn't change. You've got um, uh, particular uh, objects, say atoms, which interact with each other, and that's a sort of, it's the positions that matter. Whereas in a thing like flockings of birds, it's not so much the positions that matter, but the movements, the movements interact with each other. So it's a space-time thing. You, you, these synergies are defined in space-time. Uh, okay, and uh, there's the fact that in physics you look for fixed laws, whereas in coordination dynamics the laws are evolving. Um, and they depend on the context. So it's a different kind of beast, but you can uh, you bear in mind that this is what you're doing, and you do the science that way. So we have this um, rather different kind of structure than what you get in physics, but it works differently. Well now, um, now I'm going to talk about Winograd's language simulation. Uh, well, as I said, this is a complicated program for uh, interpreting language. And how does he go about it? Well, it's a bit similar. He uh, starts off asking how language works. And this leads him to use a particular kind of grammar. It doesn't, it doesn't, look, for, doesn't look for static structures, such as um, people like Chomsky do. They... Um, it, it, it looks at what's happening during language. The, the grammar is defined in these terms. What does the grammar do? Uh, and you also, if you're considering meaning, it's no good considering language in isolation. It has to be language in a world. So he's, he simulated a, a blocks world where you could ask questions about blocks or um, ask it to uh, do things with blocks. Um, and uh, that would test whether it was understanding what you were saying. Um, then you, you write the program, you hypothesize to what's going on, you represent it as a flowchart, and uh, then the flowchart you turn into a bit of program. Uh, just to give you a little picture, this is um, the, the structure. You notice things on the left are um, concerned with the... Uh, interpretation of language, things like grammar. Things on the right are concerned with what you do once you've understood the grammar. And things like blocks and uh, something which moves. And uh, there's a flow chart. Uh, let me explain the logic of this. Um, uh, verbs can be either transitive or intransitive. If it's transitive, the verb doesn't have an object. If it's now, if it's intransitive, it doesn't have an object. If it's transitive, it does have an object. So you see what kind of verb it is. <coughs> then if it's intransitive, you're done. If it's transitive, you look for the noun phrase that it's connected with. And this is a flow chart which describes this process of checking out whether things fit your model of grammar. So lots and lots of these. Uh, there's a representation of meaning. Uh, here's an example sentence. Harry slept on the porch after he gave Alice the jewels. This is quite a complicated sentence. Um, the meaning is to be divided into bits, like the uh, first one. Uh, it's, about, it's about Harry sleeping. Uh, it's about the fact that he slept on the porch. So this really one, um, is it really one you get here and here. They're the same thing. So this structure represents the fact that the um, sleeping action was in the same thing it's, uh, as the location where it happened. Um, okay, so you can see roughly how it works. So a program's got to turn um, uh, a sentence into that kind of structure. So it looks at it in bits, runs its <coughs> program, make bits of structure, and that's what you get. So that's um, sort of giving a a rough picture as to what the program is. It's very nicely um, 
explained in his, uh, it was his thesis, I believe, and it's on the <coughs> internet. One point I'd just like to make, um, so that was a very complicated sentence, and there's nothing saying how you handle a complex sentence. It's, what it's doing is sort of finding bits you are, um, you're finding out how to take structures apart, following all the rules, and when you're taking them apart, you can at some point put them together to get a process. So this is just a rough idea as to what's going on. Now I'm going to move on to this um, idea of nature as a designer. Um, well, as I said earlier, this is uh, uh, human language is something amazing. It's incredibly complex and uh, Winograd's program was only looking at a small part of it. He only put in the bits that are needed for a very simple world with blocks. The human language is something vastly more complicated. Uh, how on earth uh, is this, how has nature managed to do this trick? Uh, well, the answer is that, uh, well, this is speculation. It could be examined in detail. Um, is that you develop it a bit at a time, and um, there's an idea that um, people in evolutionary biology have, there's an idea of the adjacent possible, which is uh, a, a phrase of Sue Kaufman. Um, you, you reach a certain level now, and there's something fairly similar to it, uh, which is a bit better. You may find that thing that's a bit better. That's the adjacent possible. Or you can turn, talk in terms of... Uh, Stepping stones are places where you might stand for a bit and you can step from one to the next. So the idea would be that uh, you can advance a bit at a time and what you, you're probably doing with language is you're doing one new thing. And um, uh, speculation here, I uh, picked uh, a uh, concept in language I knew about the past continuous tense. Um, uh, I was eating is something which is in the past and it's continuous, it's a process going on. I looked up uh, on the web the definition of this, so, and the one thing says uh, it's the past continuous tense is used to say what we're in the middle of doing at a particular moment in the past. Um, well, that, that's um, the way you could use this. Um, I was, uh, while I was eating, something happened that would be an example of that. So you might say at some point somebody got the idea that this process could be used to handle this sort of situation and gradually this got established. Anyway, you can see in principle, um, this is only principle and uh, research would be needed to see if it really works, but you can um, uh, build up, um, well, you can see in principle why this amazing thing, human language, could have appeared uh, just through natural evolution processes. So this is sort of all fitting together. These synergies are complicated structures, but there may be a way of producing them. Okay, so um, I just mentioned that the reason this works is because you've got modules. And so you can add a module or slightly modify it. Uh, right. Um, and um, so just to elaborate this on a bit, uh, on this a bit, you're getting uh, better and better matches between what you want to do and what you're able to do. It's a bit like a game of chance. Every now and then you hit the jackpot. This uh, jackpot is a new strategy for something like communication. So uh, you get more and more powerful mechanisms. I just mentioned one thing which is rather interesting. Uh, again, it's connected with human capacities. Uh, someone called Terence, Terence Deacon uh, wrote a book called Man, the Symbolic Species. Uh, this is connected with the fact that uh, people who work on sign theory distinguishes three kinds of sign. The sign is something with meaning. Uh, iconic, where the sign it resembles what you're um, talking about. Indexing is used for building structures. But one does these both deal with a current situation and something called a symbol deals with uh, something which is not the current situation. You might um, talk about something that might happen in the future. Uh, and this seems to be a human capability. Chimpanzees can be taught human language to a certain extent, but they can't 
to do it together with symbol use. So at some point, this um, ability to use symbols gradually developed. Okay, it's just by the by, but I'm now going to talk about something which is, I think is really important for developing theory, which I call the pairing phenomenon. Uh, you think about what goes on in language. I use some process in my brain for talking to you. You are using some process in your brain which hopefully uh, generates something resembling what I'm talking about. That only works because there has to be a close match. Um, if I were talking in French and you didn't understand French, that would not happen. So, um, this uh, communication only works when you've got pairs that fit. And as the process evolves, you've got a kind of co-evolution. Uh, pairing will turn out to be something very important. Um, I'll give examples in a moment. But one thing you're... I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the double helix. And there you've got pairing. It's because um, one, one of the four bases can bond with another, and, and another, the, uh, another can, can bond with another. This ensures precise pairing between the two strands of DNA, which, as you know, is um, responsible for replication. So you can, your copy is preserved. Um, Okay, so that's an example of pairing. Um, depends on the fact of two things being closely correlated. Um, uh, well, <coughs> if people are doing things together, say you're trying to move something, you wobble about a bit and then you work out how to move things smoothly. You've paired your two processes and get a, a smooth outcome. Uh, there has to be correspondence. Well, there is correspondence between language and the community. Language adapts to what the community is doing. So here's a co-adaptation. Uh, using language you can uh, do new things, and, uh, but then when you've got a new thing you can develop language which um, describes it. Um, and a thing which is uh, another thing is these are all slightly subtly different. Ideas and their realization. Um, if you have an idea then this, there's something, uh, there are specific things which correspond to that idea. <coughs> so that's how ideas work. It's a new kind of connection. You develop an idea by making it correspond to something you can do. So this is a fascinating idea, um, which I think to some extent is in Kelsler, but I think it's all very general. Okay, yeah, as I said, it depends on co-adaptation. Well, I'm going to come on to a rather interesting um, book. Or, um, must be more, more than 10 years ago, someone called Alexa Yardley contacted me with ideas which are a little like these and sounded rather strange. And it's only now that I've got into this new way of thinking that I can see what she's talking about. And it's really quite profound. Uh, you find that a, a sentence has actually got considerable significance. So let me just give a rough indication as to what this is about. Um, this is the book. Um, I say it's a kind of, you could see it as a development of a synergetic perspective, but it's written in a very intuitive basis. She says you won't, you won't understand this unless you think in a certain way. Um, okay. Well, here's something at the beginning. Um, an entity is always part of a process. A process is always part of a system, which is always part of an entity. Process and system. This produces system within system, and systems within, and systems of systems. Well, when you think about it, this is quite uh, a, a succinct expression of things I've been talking about. Because uh, a synergy is a kind of entity. Uh, you can think of it just as a, an entity that forms a part of something else. Uh, you're switching to a different level of description. Um, but also as a system, it, it works because it's a system built up out of parts. At the same time, the important thing about the system is it's got processes associated with it. So you've got this pairing of process and system. And that's one idea at the beginning. Uh, she calls oppositional dynamics instead of pairing. Um, systems within systems, 
Well, let me. Uh, um, oh yes, I, I'll just say that process and system are really two parts of an entity. Process, um, in a technical term, uh, diachronic and synchronic. That simply means that um, when things are moving over time, that's called diachronic. Um, when you're talking about things are structured at one time, that's called synchronic. So that's really the difference between pro process and system. She actually does talk about the relationship between space and time in this kind of way. Um, that's what I've already said. <coughs> now, I think it's quite useful to um, see that what she's talking about can be portrayed in pictures, because pictures are one way you come to understand things. And this is her, uh, she says, everything is contained within this picture. Uh, well, perhaps. Uh, but what it's telling you, you see, you can see this as either two things or one thing. So one thing can be pictures as two, or uh, one thing could, under certain conditions, start to become two. So this is a, a key point of what we've been talking about. And, and there's a third thing. Um, uh, if you wait a moment, the third thing will suddenly appear. Um, these uh, this correspondence always takes place within a, a background uh, because, as I said in connection with language, language evolves as pairing occurs because you're doing some coordination. There's this triadic aspect which actually uh, was first thought of in the 19th century by um, uh, John Sanders Peirce. Um, uh, but she's looking at it in a slightly different way um, because the connections can be used in various ways. Um, well, let me just say from points of view of expressing it mathematically, and it's, it's sort of implicit in what um, she says, actually. We can imagine you know, two might separate more and more, and that would have a mathematical description if there's some control parameter uh, which is influencing what is happening. You, so mathematically, you would have some parameter which would switch you from one thing to another if you were developing this mathematically. Well, I would say this is all very well. Does it really happen? Well, now, that's how this works. There's a, an amazing thing which, again, not very many people know about, called somatics. Uh, this actually shows um, water responding to music, believe it or not. Um, you will see what happens when you play music to it. You'll see symmetries of various types developing, some six-fold, five-fold, two-fold, and so on. visited the lab person uh, used this uh, still still okay, uh, stop it now um, see what I'm saying here um, well this is some process in time connecting intimately with process in space so this shows you that it's not a trivial matter it really happens uh, you don't need biology, nothing biological here, but there is water, which may be important. Uh, uh, some people say water is a, uh, a complicated thing, uh, which I may come to in a moment. Um, <coughs> okay. Sort of system, oh, yeah, I was just going to explain how it's done. Um, you have, uh, and you can buy the equipment, uh, I think you probably need quite a bit of money for it. But it's um, a uh, cuvette with water in it. Something underneath it is essentially a speaker, which makes it vibrate. By the way, uh, Faraday was the person who discovered this first. <laughs> he didn't have these things. Then you shine a special light source, and its reflections off the surface produce these pictures. So that's how it's done. OK, well, now I want to um, get back to the system of systems. Uh, now, system of systems, as um, someone pointed out earlier, is something familiar in physics, like molecules are built up out of atoms. 
but we don't seem to get the um, this business of uh, um, coordination dynamics with information being important. Um, but it seems to happen under these conditions. Um, incidentally, there are time crystals. The current edition of Scientific American mentions that, which is a bit more like this. Time crystals are materials which, when you activate them, uh, produce <coughs> periodic structures. So they really found a similar sort of thing, but not, I don't think, not the same kind of structures quite. They're quite interesting ones. Um, uh, I think uh, a difference is, um, well, if we take, say, structures in astronomy, like clusters of stars, that happens in space, but somatics happens in water. So water is different because, um, well, it's a liquid, and also I think nonlinearity is important. So it may, it's quite likely that these things happen in nonlinear active systems. Uh, and physicists have not really studied it very much because it's uh, difficult to quantify. But people like Prigogine have actually made some studies on it. But now it's really going ahead. Uh, I'll just also mention um, my um, had a <coughs> collaboration with somebody who uh, was um, music uh, music staff at Trinity before the present um, person, Paul Wingfield. Uh, I got interested in the fact that m music appeared to have meaning, and um, I thought about this, and we discussed it, and um, wrote a paper at a conference, um, and uh, well, the point that she brought up was that themes seem to be an important thing. You can use a theme in different pieces of music. And when you look at themes, uh, you know, parallels between themes and genes, which counts for specificity, complexity, functionality, and arbitrariness of musical structures. So there's something there. Music may also be like this, uh, fit into this picture. Now, some really controversial thing. Um, uh, Jacques Benvenist, who gave the, uh, uh, the the key, the main lecture at the Cavendish, um, made a claim, which has subsequently been taken up by Luc Montagnier. Um, what they say it was done uh, is they can there are specific signals which can be um, directed at uh, water or some biologically active material that has biological effects. Uh, this was attacked strongly by John Maddox of Nature, so it's been uh, dismissed. Uh, the idea, idea that this, the general idea of biological signal, that, that signals play an important part in biology, is a perfectly reasonable idea. He said it's not just the structures, but the signals. And I think had it been proposed by anyone other than Ben Venice, people would have said, oh yes. It was, uh, when it was proposed by Ben Venice, who was dismissed by Maddox and company in a very dubious way, uh, when I won't go into it, uh, they would have said, hmm, nice idea. But anyway, that's the way it is. Um, uh, okay, another thing is that I mentioned ideas being um, uh, opposite or in parallel with what ideas do. Now, I'll just mention a very controversial idea of Yardley's um, uh, yeah. Um, so she says uh, man is connected with the idea of man um, in other words man came from an idea uh, there's a specific man in mind mind is a general thing it is the idea of man which had to be present somewhere before man could appear well this is pretty well like intelligent design it sort of means that evolution is directed uh, and I think that will eventually be accepted. Uh, but dogma says it's not, nothing like this happens. If you look at dogma, you'd find if you really want, well, okay, there's, there's a sequence which could have led to man, but people never uh, discuss the probabilities. And for it to be convincing, you'd have to um, compute the probability that um, uh, a given sequence would evolve and produce man and compare that with a number of possibilities. In other words, you could quantify this argument and decide whether it made sense or not. A lot of people have decided it doesn't make sense, but they have to be quiet, because if you say um, you, 
your uh, intelligent design might be true. You might lo lose your job. Now I've retired, so I can't lose my job. Uh, okay, uh, I'll just mention uh, this book by Ballard. Um, she took up the idea of parallels between quantum, well, quantum theory and essentially um, behavior of societies. And I think, um, well, she had an idea agential re realism and intra actions, which are basically identical syn to synergies, but independently discovered, I think. Um, and the idea that relationships are important, um, like not states. Anyway, she has a this is worked out in great detail in the book, and she explains some of the mysterious features of quantum mechanics in this way. So I think ultimately we will um, uh, be able to make the connections, um, a mathematical connection between the um, synergetics and coordination theory, and uh, will then be realized that uh, quantum theory is seen now is just a misconceived idea. It was good for some things, but ultimately wrong with others. Okay, so my conclusion is, um, well, there are more things to dream of in, than are dreamt of in the philosophy of mainstream science. Um, we already understand this to some extent, and this should be the beginning of a new era of science. I'll finish now with a video showing what you might term natural somatics. It's when I took up a lake in the Austrian Alps known as Lunasee, and it, you can see it on YouTube. If you have a light source, is the sun, and the video shows the sun reflected off ripples on the surface of the lake. This reflection is particularly spectacular near the edge of the lake, as you'll be able to see towards the end of the clip. Okay, so there we are. Thank you very much.